Hello everybody, this is a recorded lecture on the regional anatomy of the back. I'll be your instructor for this web-based tutorial. My name is Mike Pasco, aka Dr. Pasco. I have a PhD in neurophysiology and I'll be a co-instructor in human body block. And this lecture is um, scheduled to take place on August 20th, but if you're listening to this now, that means I am probably on paternity leave. This is what I look like. Maybe by the end of human body block, I'll be able to come back in and help out in lab. Uh, but for now, we'll just continue on through the tutorial, listening to my voice, taking you through these concepts on the back. I do like to begin a lot of my lectures with motivational, inspirational quotes. This one here by Chewbacca. And I fully appreciate from where you're sitting, this is what human anatomy looks like right now. 10 weeks, lots of structures, and this is the view from where I'm usually sitting. Uh, now it's a little different recording this from home, but yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of digital technology in the classroom and really excited to see the ways that technology can supplement anatomy education. And so if you ever want to talk about anything in that domain, I'll be your guy for sure. And it is my goal to make all of this anatomy on the back and extremities as painless as possible. So let's get started. This lecture will cover the back, and just in terms of regional anatomy, the back is considered the posterior aspect of the trunk. So if you were to provide some discrete boundaries for the back, you would say that the superior boundary would be uh, where the neck begins, and the inferior boundary would be this region down here, just superior to the gluteal region. So nothing fancy, nothing specific in terms of boundaries for the back, but nonetheless, this is the region that we will cover in this lecture. We're gonna start with some of the bony structures found in the back. The principal bony structure would be the vertebral column. And just as an overview, I've provided for you three views of the vertebral column, an anterior view, a posterior view, and a lateral view. So what we're seeing here are the components of the vertebral column, which consist of several vertebrae. And these vertebrae are separated by intervertebral discs, and the vertebral column extends from the cranium superiorly to the coccyx inferiorly. So we're going to go through and investigate certain aspects of the vertebrae and other characteristics of the vertebral column, but to um, be brief in general, we can think of the vertebral column as providing a protective and supportive function um, in the body. So protective in that it's mainly providing a, a bony casement for the spinal cord, and supportive in that it is supporting the weight of the body with increasing amounts of weight being uh, borne upon the lumbar region of the vertebral column. So as we move on to discuss the components of the vertebral column, the vertebrae, let's consider the structural components of each one of these units of the vertebral column. And anatomists divide these components into anterior and posteriorly located components. So this is a superior view of a lumbar vertebra, and this is a lateral view of that same vertebra. And what this illustration is depicting using this vertical line as a demarcating boundary between the anterior and posterior components of the vertebra. In terms of anterior components, quite simple. There's just the one, which is the vertebral body, which we can see in the superior and lateral views here. Posterior from the vertebral body are the following components. On each side, a pedicle, and extending from the pedicle, there are superior and inferior articular processes. In this superior view, we can see the superior articular process, uh, but not, not that well. So let's draw our attention to the side view, the lateral view, where we can see the superior articular process here and the inferior articular process here. We're going to talk about the role these processes play in forming a very important joint of the vertebral column. Then as we extend posteriorly from the articular processes, we'll find the laminae of the vertebra. 
so one on each side, and extending from the union of the two laminae is the spinous process. Okay, so we can see the spinous process in the superior view here. Here is the corresponding spinous process now in the lateral view. I should also mention the transverse processes, which we can see emerging from the lateral aspect of the pedicle. Here's a transverse process. Here's the other opposing transverse process. Now we can just barely make out the transverse process in the lateral view. Now the vertebrae also have vertebral foramina and the vertebral foramina is going to be found right in the middle of a structure that is formed by the pedicle and the lamina. So if you look here on our list of structures, the pedicle and lamina have an asterisk next to them denoting their role in forming the vertebral arch. Now older textbooks will refer to this as the neural arch and this is an arch that is providing that protective function by closing off the vertebral column and forming a vertebral foramina that houses the spinal cord. And if we look in the lateral view of the vertebra, we'll also find another structure that doesn't really fit that well into anterior versus posterior, but it is a very important um, region or, or structure that is formed by the previous structures that we've mentioned, and those are the notches. So this is a superior, excuse me, this is an inferior notch of this vertebra. It's much larger than the superior notch on the same vertebra. So basically we're following the vertebral body along the pedicle and down an articular process to note that there is a notch in the bone. And when these two notches come together, they will form the intervertebral foramen. And it's through the intervertebral foramen that the spinal nerve is transmitted. We'll see that in subsequent illustrations. This slide summarizes the structural components again, but in a more schematized fashion. So that way we can see the extent of the vertebral body and in a much more simplified way visualize where the pedicles are, processes, transverse and spinous, as well as where the laminae exist. So study this image as well. And of course, structure begets function. So let's take a look at the following functions of these components of the vertebrae. So in this illustration of a superior view of a lumbar vertebra, we can see listed for us on the left the parts that we just talked about previously and the corresponding functions listed on the right. So in terms of spinous processes and transverse processes, they are functionally relevant for muscle attachment. They are bony outgrowths which have grown in response to the, the pulling force applied to them by various muscles of the back. And as a consequence, they're rather long and prominent landmarks of our vertebra. And muscles, of course, have the function of shortening and producing various movements. So we can see that highlighted here by coloring the spinous and transverse processes in blue. Articular processes are shown in yellow and they again have a role in a very specialized joint of the vertebral column, the zygapophyseal joint, also known as the facet joint. Now these processes forming this joint are going to restrict certain movements while also permitting other movements. So we'll say that the articular processes are here for um, increased stability of the vertebral column, but they also form a synovial joint that allows for a certain range of motion. And when we stack up all the vertebrae in series, we can then um, experience a very wide range of motion at these articular processes. Vertebral arch, I just mentioned, comprised of pedicle and lamina, and this is going to provide that protective function for the spinal cord. And lastly, the vertebral body has a role in supporting the weight of the body, as we'll see in subsequent slides. So I just took you through the components of a stereotypical vertebra, but things do vary considerably as we move through the different regions of the vertebral column. So all the way on the right hand side here is a fully articulated vertebral column and the color coding is 
illustrating for you the different regions of the vertebral column, which are cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and at the very distal or inferior end, the coccyx. And then pulled out from this vertebral column to the left are representative vertebrae of cervical, thoracic, and lumbar regions. So let's look at some of the key features of these different vertebrae, which are listed here on the left. Transverse foramina is a characteristic of the cervical vertebrae. And we can see the transverse foramen on one side of our cervical vertebra, highlighted right here. This is a foramen that allows the transmission of the vertebral artery up into the skull through the foramen magnum. So we're really going to just find our transverse foramina in our cervical vertebrae where we find the vertebral artery. Coming down to the thoracic vertebrae, they have costal facets which give them their unique morphology. So a costal facet is going to be a place of articulation for either the head or the tubercle of the rib, which we find in the thoracic region of the vertebral column. And then with the lumbar vertebrae, we don't really see it here. We'll see it in a subsequent slide. But I'd like you to understand that the mammillary process is a very specific and unique bony landmark of the lumbar vertebrae, which allow for attachment of the multifidus muscles. And also take this time to appreciate that the body of the vertebrae increases in its cross-sectional area, or in simple terms, in its size, as we move from cervical to thoracic to lumbar. And this is really needed as we start to load the inferior regions of the spine to a greater extent. Okay, so much more weight needs to be supported in the lumbar spine compared with the cervical spine, therefore a larger um, uh, vertebral body. Here's a superior view of a thoracic um, vertebra, just to again allow us to discuss some of the unique characteristics. And I would say that we can really focus on the costal facets that we can find on transverse process, as well as the body of the vertebra. Moving to the lumbar vertebra, now we can see the mammillary process much better. This is on the superior articular process. Again, where the lumbar vertebra attaches. And the much larger vertebral body. So what underlying anatomy can account for changes with advancing age? We know that with advancing age, there is a tendency for bone density to decrease. And this happens throughout the body, but we're talking about the vertebral column. So if we take a mid-sagittal section through a lumbar vertebra of an older adult, we may expect to find a decreased bone density, which makes this trabecular bone uh, much more spaced out. Uh, the lattice work is much weaker of the way that this trabecular bone is structured. So as a consequence of this weakened um, internal structure, the articular surfaces of the vertebral body will bow inward. So this is a superior as well as inferior articular surfaces collapsing at the center. And if the center of the vertebra is collapsing inward the per and the periphery is not changing, this means that the loading of the body's weight through the vertebral column will be received primarily by the periphery of the vertebral body. And all of this increase in compressive force will result in the formation of osteophytes. And osteophytes are shown in this um, photograph below as um, asterisks, just to indicate where we have abnormal bone growth in response to compression. That's the way bone works. If it is not receiving compressive or tensile forces, it will degrade. However, if there is an increase in compressive or tensile fo forces within trabecular bone, that will result in growth. And so focus here, I know there's lots of osteophytes in this vertebra, but we're really focusing on the osteophytes that have formed on the periphery of the vertebral body. And this will really um, impact the range of motion that is offered at the vertebral column. Again, typically seen with advancing age.
So I know we've touched on this already, but just to um, repeat myself, the vertebral column is subdivided into the following regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal and as we look at these regions in more detail we can see that the cervical spine comprises seven vertebrae thoracic 12 and lumbar 5. Now that might not be news to you you probably are aware of this concept if you've had an undergrad anatomy course I know not all of you have so we'll just get everyone on the same page here and I do want to bring your attention that sacral and coccygeal regions these were independent bony structures but they became fused so we don't call them sacral and coccygeal vertebrae we instead just refer to the five sacral components as being one fused structure called the sacrum and then off of the inferior aspect of the sacrum is the fused coccyx okay so these are the regions of the spine in a lateral view and this also gives us an opportunity to look at the curvatures that are present within the vertebral column now there's two ways to describe the curvatures of the vertebral column in this lateral view and they are kyphosis and lordosis. The two regions of the spine that are in a kyphosis are the thoracic and sacral. So think of kyphosis as being an anterior curvature, so an, uh, almost an anterior flexion of the vertebral column. And this is in a normal developed adult, kyphotic, thoracic, and sacral spine. Compare that with the cervical and lumbar spine. These are in a more lordotic curvature. So a posterior curvature, if you will, think of it as presenting in an extension of the vertebral column. And where did these vertebral curvatures come from? It all relates back to embryological developments. In this illustration, we can see um, the embryo in utero depicted here on the left, the newborn, the adolescent, and then the fully matured adult. Now, embryologically, um, the, the fetus within uh, the, the womb is going to have an anteriorly flexed C-shaped vertebral column. So overall, the vertebral column is in a kyphotic position. So thoracic and sacral regions are already shaped um, in utero and as a newborn. Now there are, that's why the thoracic and sacral regions can be thought of as primary curvatures. And this also explains why both primary curvatures are kyphotic in presentation. Because the fetal vertebral column is anteriorly flexed. Now, secondary curvatures come into play as the um, toddler or the newborn begins to meet certain um, developmental milestones. So before I give them to you, just have a think about what would cause a lordosis of a cervical and lumbar spine. What major milestones, developmental motor behaviors would be corresponding to cervical lordotic curvature? And I would say that it is the ability to support the head. Holding up the weight of the head will definitely contribute to the cervical lordosis. And then later on in development, as the toddler begins to walk, they will now be loading on the lumbar spine, and the lumbar spine will then develop its lordosis. And we can see that lordosis now present in adolescence as well as the mature adult. And this is the description of the development of the curvatures of the vertebral column. So the ones that come along with developmental milestones, these are referred to as secondary curvatures. Now there are a series of abnormal spinal curvatures that you should be aware of. This lateral view is going to show us um, a few of the excessive curvatures in the sagittal plane. This is the normal curvature, just to remind you of the kypho kyphosis and lordosis of the vertebral column. And now in the middle panel, this is excessive kyphosis. So think of this thoracic spine as undergoing degenerative changes in bone density and the vertebral bodies experiencing a series of microfractures, causing an overall result of a thoracic vertebral column curving more anteriorly. So this is an excessive kyphosis. We see this um, in a lot of uh, geriatric population. 
excessive lordosis would then be the um, corresponding excessive posterior curvature of the lordotic spine. Not necessarily looking for this in older adults, but perhaps in gymnasts, um, African American women, for example, there is a predominantly excessively lordotic vertebral column. Now there are a couple of you know, uh, colloquial terms for these presentations. So excessive lordosis would be known as swayback and excessive kyphosis. This would result in a dowager's hump. Okay, so a very prominent upper thoracic spine. Okay. We can also have deviations of the vertebral column in the frontal plane. So these lateral deviations or lateral curvatures are referred to as scoliosis. So we can see again the normal on the left and the abnormal on the right and this spine is deviated to the left side in a presentation of scoliosis and I fully anticipate that um, a few of the donors in cadaver lab will have a degree of scoliosis. This is something that's observed regularly and uh, that will really give you a you know a good appreciation of how the body can function even though the vertebral column can be in an abnormal position. And this is of course my favorite example of excessive thoracic kyphosis. See Montgomery Burns and his his mighty hump there we can see his very prominent thoracic vertebral column. Again one an example of a, of a population that is prone to excessive thoracic kyphosis, the, the geriatric population. Okay, those are the bones, primary bones of the back. We're talking about vertebral column, how the vertebrae stack up together to form the vertebral column. And now let's take a look more specifically at the joints that are formed between these bones. This is a lateral view of the cervical spine. So we could say C1 through C7. And the joints I want to highlight for you are one that I've mentioned before, the zygapophyseal, aka facet joint, which is the articulation between the superior articular process of a vertebra and the inferior articular process of the vertebra above. So this is a synovial joint. This is the zygapophyseal joint. And we've also talked about the intervertebral joint where the bodies of the vertebra articulate with one another and an intervertebral disc is mediating the intervertebral joint. We'll find the intervertebral disc in between the vertebral bodies. The intervertebral disc consists of a central nucleus pulposus and a peripheral annulus fibrosus. So the annulus fibrosus is fibrocartilaginous and the nucleus pulposus is a soft mucoid gel right at its center and it becomes more fibrocartilaginous with age. So I would say that I've heard most physical therapists that have dissected intervertebral discs describe this as more of a, of a consistency of a toothpaste and the annulus fibrosus is again a very dense fibrocartilage. And thinking about the overall changes um, with age in that the nucleus pulposus becomes more fibrocartilaginous, we can appreciate that the vertebral discs account for 20 to 25 percent of vertebral column length. So with changes in the properties of nucleus pulposus with age, we would expect corresponding changes in the vertebral column of older adults. We would even expect for a loss in height of an individual with advancing age all due to changes in the intervertebral disc and its properties. Now the intervertebral disc is not completely interfacing with the bone of the vertebral body. There is a hyaline cartilage end plate on the intervertebral surface of the vertebral body. So we'll find the hyaline cartilage as a strong anchor for a majority of the intervertebral disc. And now looking at an anterior view of two vertebrae and the intervertebral disc um, in between these vertebrae, we can see that the annulus fibrosus approaches the periphery of the vertebral bodies and takes the form of a crossing fiber system to offer more stability 
of the vertebral column and also in an attempt to maintain the position of the intervertebral disc directly underneath the vertebral bodies. Now the intervertebral disc does a good job of staying where it needs to stay, but it can move with pathology. So this is a bulging disc. And what we can see here is a, an image, I believe an MRI, of a patient that has been referred for imaging. And we can see three different examples, three different stages of disc migration. So this, with the blue arrow between L3 and L4, this is what a normal disc should look like, confined within the intervertebral space. Now the L4, L5 disc we can see is bulging at this point, which corresponds to this illustration, this superior view showing that the nucleus pulposus is starting to migrate posterolaterally, and it's pushing the annulus fibrosus out from the periphery of the vertebral body. So that would have this presentation in a sagittal view in an MRI. Then a full-on herniation of an intervertebral disc would look like this on an MRI. And this would be the corresponding idea illustrated as the nucleus pulposus escaping from the confines of the annulus fibrosus. So that is a herniated disc. And the most common direction of disc herniation is in a posterolateral direction. So that's what we can see in this superior view, nucleus pulposus leaving the annulus fibrosus in a posterior lateral direction. Now there is a very large supportive ligament that we'll talk about in subsequent slides located just behind the intervertebral disc. So it's very rare for the nucleus pulposus to go posterior approaching the spinal cord. It's much more likely for the nucleus pulposus to go to the side. And the consequence of this that we can see is impingement of the spinal nerve. And you'll recall that the spinal nerve transmits um, afferent and efferent information. So we may expect in a posterior lateral herniation that the patient would experience or demonstrate sensory and or motor deficits depending on what level the herniation is occurring and what corresponding spinal nerve is being in, um, impinged upon. Well, speaking of ligaments, let's move on from the joints, the intervertebral discs, onto vertebral ligaments, which are set up between adjacent vertebrae to offer support to the vertebral column. So let's start with this schematic. It's kind of a posterior superior view of the schematicized vertebral column. Anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments are these broad, flat ligaments we can see on their respective aspects of the vertebral bodies, with this being anterior longitudinal ligaments and this being posterior longitudinal ligaments. Here is the supraspinous ligament. It is positioned posterior to the spinous processes. Interspinous ligaments are in between the main body of the spinous processes. Supraspinous ligament is just riding along the posterior tip. Interspinous ligaments more within the central aspect of the spinous process. Ligamentum flavum illustrated here in le um, yellow. They are connecting adjacent laminae. Remember the lamina here? That is what ligamentum flavum is spanning. And ligamentum flavum is yellow, of course, because of its large amount of elastin, which has nothing to do with this 80s wrapper, Flava Flav, but I think that you want to appreciate the level of depth and appreciation Flava Flav has for anatomical information. So the ligamentum flavum is yellow in presentation. I encourage you to look for this when dissecting your cadavers. And Flava Flav, you know, what's, what's one of his most prominent colors that he's wearing? He's always sporting the gold, always got the yellow. So we now know that Flava Flav is very interested in anatomy and took his name from the yellow appearance of this ligament of the vertebral column. And looking at the vertebral ligaments in more of an anatomical 
position, these illustrations, uh, this is from the Tema Atlas of Anatomy. I'll just point out for you anterior longitudinal ligament spanning several vertebra. Same thing with the posterior longitudinal ligament. Here's ligamenta flava, ligamentum flavum if we're talking about just one, interspinous ligaments, intertransverse spanning the transverse processes, and then the supraspinous ligament riding along the tips of the spinous processes. And again in a sagittal section I won't take you through. I think that you'll be able to identify these ligaments on your own just in a slightly different view, a lateral sagittal section. In this view the pedicles have been cut and removed so now we can see the lamina and the ligamenta flava in a much more um, clear presentation. And the anterior longitudinal ligament position here, intertransverse ligaments spanning the transverse processes. Now flipping that vertebral column around where the pedicles have been removed, we can now see the posterior longitudinal ligament and where it interfaces with the intervertebral disc. And imagine that nucleus pulposus is beginning to migrate posteriorly. It's going to have a real hard time going through the PLL, hence the posterolateral herniation. So we've gone through the bony anatomy, we've gone through the joints, and we've gone through the ligaments. So now let's move on through uh, and continue on our discussion of the back with the vertebral canal. So the vertebral canal is formed by adjacent vertebral foramina. And the spinal cord is the primary structure that occupies this canal. So what we can see in this posterior view is the extent of the spinal cord, which begins at foramen magnum, this large opening in the base of the skull. And the spinal cord then extends inferiorly. And it actually does not extend the full extent of the vertebral column. The spinal cord is occupying vertebral canal all the way down to the level of L2. So this very distal end of the spinal cord corresponds with vertebra L2. And what we can see on the right are different transverse sections at the various regions of the spinal cord. So at the cervical region, for example, or thoracic I should say, we're able to see the vertebral um, canal occupied by the spinal cord and its corresponding meninges. Then when we get down to L2 and lower where the spinal cord is now complete and no longer visible, what we're seeing now are the, um, the ventral and dorsal roots of the spinal nerves. They're coming out laterally to form the spinal nerve. And this is a cut all the way down at the sacrum which does underscore the fact that the ventral and dorsal roots are extending all the way inferiorly and leaving through foramina of the sacrum as well as spinal nerves. And spinal nerves are a component of the somatic uh, nervous system, so part of our peripheral nervous system. And in the sagittal section, we can see that the spinal nerves uh, exist in the following numbers, cervical, eight pairs, thoracic 12, lumbar 5, sacral 5, and we typically think of there being one single coccygeal pair. So in total, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And the spinal nerves are transmitted through the intervertebral foramen. And recall the intervertebral foramen is formed by the um, superior and inferior notches of the vertebra where they come together to form the intervertebral foramen. Now the one thing to notice here is that the cervical nerves are eight pairs in number. So for the most part <clears throat> the number of spinal nerves corresponds with the number of vertebrae at the corresponding region with the cervical spinal nerves being the exception. So we then say that there are regional differences in where spinal nerves exit the intervertebral foramina. So the main one to get a hold of, the main concept to understand, is what's going on at the cervical level. So cervical spinal nerves, number eight, 
and that's what we see here on the left hand side of this vertebral column there are only seven cervical vertebrae so what we notice is that C1 is going to leave the corresponding region of the spinal cord and ascend and become superior to vertebra C1 also known as the atlas so from there on down in the cervical spine the spinal nerves are named for the correspondingly named vertebra that is found above that nerve so for example if this is cervical vertebra C6 that means that this is spinal nerve C6 okay so just to revise what I just said excuse me the spinal nerves are named in the cervical region for the in corresponding inferior vertebra so C6 spinal nerve is named for the C6 cervical vertebra for which it emerges on top of okay now that gets us from C1 through C7 but then what do we do with the eighth cervical spinal nerve well we do something unconventional we, we name it C8 so spinal nerve C8 it would be found below cervical vertebra C7 and then for the rest of the regions of the spinal cord thoracic um, all the way down we name the spinal nerve for the corresponding vertebra that is superior to that nerve okay so just to give you an example if we find T11 this is the T11 the thoracic level of the spinal cord and if we were to follow that nerve as it emerges from the vertebral column we would find that it emerges from below thoracic vertebra 11 okay so T11 will emerge from between T12 vertebra and T11 vertebra whereas C6 is going to arise from between C5 and C6 so like a lot of things in anatomy learn the exception to the rule and you'll be fine the exception to the rule is the cervical um, spinal nerves so I know you've done some drawings with Dr. Carey about the axons that are found within spinal nerves but just take a moment to um, review a cross section through the thoracic spine to see the various components of the spinal nerve which the spinal nerve is formed by the anterior and posterior root so here's the spinal nerve here for a very short distance before it branches into a ventral and dorsal ramus also known as an anterior or posterior ramus okay so we need to know about the posterior or dorsal ramus with the back because that ramus will further divide into a lateral and medial branch with the medial branch going to the skin to provide cutaneous innervation and the lateral branch going to the musculature of the back. In lab, you'll also be performing an investigation of the vertebral canal. You'll be removing the laminae of several vertebra. You'll be looking at the meninges and then the spinal cord within the vertebral canal. So the first thing you'll notice upon entering the vertebral canal would be the dura mater and in this illustration the dura mater has been incised down the midline and peeled apart to the side and pinned so that way we can look in at the corresponding arachnoid matter which is still remains at the inferior aspect here arachnoid's been cleared off for this region of the illustration and the pia mater is also present <clears throat> around the spinal cord but it's going to be very hard to demonstrate pia matter in dissection. We basically think of pia matter as being intimately bonded to the white matter of the spinal cord. But where we do see a little bit of pia matter is the lateral expansions of pia matter that come together to form denticulate ligaments. So you'll find several pairs of denticulate ligaments as you investigate your vertebral canal inside your dura mater and the denticulate ligaments are these lateral expansions of pia mater off the spinal cord that anchor to the dura mater to offer the spinal cord some stability within the vertebral canal 
And in addition to the spinal cord occupying the vertebral canal, we'll also find a structure known as cauda equina, which is illustrated here at these lower lumbar levels. Cauda equina is going to exist inferior to that L2 region where the spinal cord terminates. Spinal cord terminates as conus medullaris. This is that inferior narrowing of the spinal cord. And off of conus medullaris is the phylum terminale. So you'd really only be able to find phylum terminale in dissection by first identifying conus medullaris and then finding phylum terminale as another extension of pia mater that extends all the way down to the coccyx to provide an inferior anchoring of the spinal cord. Back to cauda equina, it's going to comprise ventral and dorsal roots of L2, 3, 4, and 5, as well as sacral levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and the coccygeal nerve. So cauda equina is named after the horse's tail, meaning horse's tail, because this is the region of the vertebral canal where there is no spinal cord, just the roots. And this makes it a very appealing location for a procedure known as a lumbar puncture, where now we want to sample the cerebrospinal fluid that's circulating within the vertebral canal and not wanting to do any damage to the spinal cord using the, the lumbar puncture needle, um, the clinician will go to the lower lumbar levels and take the cerebrospinal fluid from this level because introducing a needle into the vertebral column here will likely result from the parting of the roots of cauda equina without causing any neurological harm to the spinal cord. This is what the vertebral canal dissection will look like in this photo from Dr. Carey's cadaver dissection guide. You'll get your laminate um, chipped away or you'll use the bone saw and then you'll be able to gain access here to the dura. You'll see the root sheath extending off the lateral aspect of the dura and this swelling or enlargement of the root sheath is the dorsal root ganglion. Cell bodies of sensory axons conveying information back to the spinal cord. And from there on out, distal to the dorsal root ganglion, we'll have the split into the dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. Just keep in mind in this dissection that the donor is prone, so you are already looking at the posterior aspect of the cadaver. So the ventral ramus is the most difficult structure to find of all of these structures in the list here because it is going to be going anteriorly or down toward the table. So you need to do a lot of dissection distal to the dorsal root ganglion down toward the table, which is in the anterior direction, to find your ventral ramus. And here's another photo of a vertebral canal dissection from the Rowan Photographic Atlas of Anatomy. Dura matter reflected. Here is the denticulate ligaments, these lateral expansions of the pia matter. These would be posterior roots or dorsal roots as they come into the root sheath and this would be a dorsal root ganglion. These branches here would be of the dorsal ramus. Ventral ramus we won't see unless we dissect further down into the, the cadaver. So we understand now that the vertebral canal is the location within the vertebral column that houses the spinal cord. And normally the vertebral column, excuse me, the vertebral canal is quite roomy and of adequate size to allow proper function of the spinal cord. But um, with advancing age, we may find that the vertebral canal can become more narrow. And this can happen at many levels of the vertebral column, but it's most common in the lumbar region. So the best way to understand lumbar spinal stenosis is to look at two lumbar vertebrae in the superior view. And I hope you can notice that one of these two vertebrae has a much more narrow vertebral foramen. And that would be the one on the right. So this is an example of lumbar spinal stenosis with stenosis referring to narrowing of the vertebral foramen. 
And if you think about the narrowing of this vertebral foramen and therefore the vertebral canal, you can easily appreciate that we may have compression of one or more of the spinal nerve roots that occupy the inferior vertebral canal. Okay. So this is a sagittal MRI which is now showing the um, lumbar spinal stenosis at this level here indicated by this arrow. So a, a narrowed intervertebral foramen which will clinically manifest as symptoms on one side. Now those symptoms um, may be of sensory or of motor origin. So some of the um, possible symptoms include numbness, cramping, pain in the back, buttocks, thighs, or calves. Remember pain can refer to different regions of the body. So you're going to need to do a very thorough screening of the patient to determine the origin of the pain. Now we also might with um, prolonged lumbar spinal stenosis find that the muscles innervated by the spinal nerves in these lower lumbar regions will start to exhibit weakness. And the peripheral nerves that arise from lumbar regions serve the lower extremity. So if we have chronic spinal stenosis, we'd actually find that the efferent information out to the muscles is impaired, resulting in weakness of the lower extremity. And so what, what could be done? How could we access or provide greater um, space within the vertebral foramen? And in a very aggressive manner, uh, what could happen is a laminectomy, which would allow for excision of the spinous process. And if you remove the spinous process altogether, you will greatly enhance the space of the vertebral foramen. And this will hopefully relieve the compression on the spinal roots, the, the posterior and anterior roots, and hopefully relieve um, the pressure on these uh, cords or roots and, and remediate this patient's symptoms. So that was the vertebral canal and its contents, a bit about the spinal cord. And now that we know about the components of the vertebral column and the joints um, that exist, let's take a moment to review the movements that can be produced at the vertebral column um, about those joints. So spinal movements are, are quite straightforward, flexion and extension, lateral flexion, lateral extension, as well as rotation. And these motions are happening primarily at the zygapophyseal joint, the facet joint. And the orientation of the zygapophyseal joint has a great deal of influence on the amount of motion offered by the spine. And if we look at cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae, we'll quickly appreciate that the zygapophyseal joint orientation varies among these different regions. And therefore, we're going to expect the movements offered at each region um, to, to differ. And so before we look at the numbers uh, behind the different motions that are allowed at different regions, let's first appreciate the underlying anatomy and look at the lateral view of cervical, thoracic, and lumbar facet joints and see that cervical facet joints, the, where the superior and inferior articular processes meet, this is at a 45 degree angle. Thoracic facet joints are oriented at a 60 degree angle and lumbar are oriented at a 90 degree angle. And we really see this 90 degree angle um, in more of the medial lateral plane. So that the degrees refer to the angle um, formed at the facet joint and then the orientation of the facet joint can be seen on these left hand illustrations with the cervical facet joints oriented in a posterior superior direction. So this would be the inferior, excuse me, the superior articular process, and it is oriented in a posterior superior orientation. And if we looked at the inferior articular process, it is oriented in an anterior inferior orientation. Thoracic, they are arranged in more of a posterior anterior direction and the lumbar processes are oriented in, excuse me, the lumbar facets are oriented more in a medial lateral position. Okay, so if you imagine 
hooking up, articulating two adjacent vertebrae and moving them around, think about the underlying zygous apophyseal joint orientation and how that would limit or restrict certain motions. And that is what this horizontal bar chart summarizes for us. In three different planes, three different motions. The y-axis will be the corresponding intervertebral joints from the occipital bone C1 all the way down to L5 S1. Remember sacral and coccygeal vertebrae are fused, so no motion there. So a horizontal bar for each of those vertebral regions and this is shown as a function of degrees of motion offered. So let's just focus on one of the bar charts for now, flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. Now you're not going to be expected to know the exact numbers or degrees of motion offered at every specific joint. You're just expected to know that, for example, flexion and extension is very occurs in a very high degree at the cervical spine and lumbar spine but not at the thoracic spine. Okay. Now this again is explained by the underlying facet joint orientation. So if we look at the lumbar and cervical, the lumbar facets are facing each other in a medial lateral presentation. So they will be very easily able to move against each other in a flexion and extension type movement. Same with cervical. Thoracic, however, are not in a very good anatomical morphology or shape to move in an anterior posterior direction in a flexion and extension. Let's look at another example as I get excited and push the wrong button. Let's go to axial rotation in the horizontal plane. So not too surprisingly, lumbar vertebrae, they're not really good at rotating. Those articular processes are vertically oriented at 90 degrees. They're going to bang into each other as soon as you start to try and twist them. But the cervical facet joints are much more, um, you know, better at rotating, especially the C1, C2 atlas on axis. That is a very specialized joint, the atlantoaxial joint, where you basically have the dens of C2 going up into the um, arch of C1 and this is a very highly mobile um, pivot joint. So we have axial rotation for C1, C2 that's off the charts but the main point here is that there's a lot of axial rotation at the cervical spine and very little at lumbar. And then lateral flexion again is not going to occur very easily at thoracic and lumbar levels but it will happen very easily at the cervical spine because of its 45 degree angle. So hopefully this bar chart conveys for you the different amounts of movement at the different regions of the spinal cord of the vertebral column and how the underlying zygapophyseal joint orientation can account for either the large amount of movement at that region or the little amount of movement offered at that region. And one cannot have motion without the activation of muscle. So now I'd like to take you through a discussion of the muscles of the back and how anatomists organize them together. So we're going to talk about the deep muscles of the back first, which include erector spinae. And erector spinae is a term in reference to a group of three muscles, spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis. So here we can see fascia overlying erector spinae. And that fascia has been removed, so now that way we can see the spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis muscles in isolation. Now when these muscles are activated, they will result in extension and lateral flexion of the vertebral column, and these muscles are innervated by dorsal rami of spinal nerves. Here's what you'll be experiencing in lab. Another photo from Dr. Carey's dissection guide. Just to get you oriented, this would be the vertebral column here. Here's the thoracolumbar fascia. This would be spinalis right here, right adjacent to the spinous processes, longissimus lateral to that, and then iliocostalis, the most lateral of the three. 
Now, I just pointed out to you the thoracolumbar fascia, and in that previous photo, the thoracolumbar fascia here is going to be this region right here. This is the posterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia. And I want you to understand that the thoracolumbar fascia is arranged into three layers. You will see the posterior layer in lab um, during this unit, and you'll see the other layers in subsequent units of this course. So this is the posterior layer. The middle layer of the thoracolumbar fascia will attach onto the spinous processes of the vertebra. And the anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia is basically the deep fascia overlying the quadratus lumborum. So these three layers form two compartments. And in this compartment here, between posterior and middle layers, we have erector spinae. Between middle and anterior layers of thoracolumbar fascia, we have quadratus lumborum. Other deep muscles of the back include a group known as transversospinalis. So the transversospinalis group consists of semispinalis and multifidus. So here we can see semispinalis as it's extending all the way up to the head and multifidus is extending all the way down to the sacrum. These muscles are innervated by dorsal rami of spinal nerves. Now this deep layer has intrinsic back muscles and these intrinsic back muscles are interspinalis and intertransversari. So interspinalis would be found in between the spinous processes. Okay, so a little interspinalis here, 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 and here. Intertransversari are located between corresponding, or excuse me, adjacent transverse processes. Now these muscles are intermingled with the interspinous and intertransverse ligaments. And if you think about their relatively small size, you'd probably assume that they're not going to be very good um, movers of the vertebral column. And histological studies support this by finding that these muscles are loaded with muscle spindles. And muscle spindles have a proprioceptive function in the body. So we would then think of the function of interspinalis and intertransversari as having a proprioceptive role. In other words, providing um, the central nervous system information about the position of the vertebral column. These muscles are not movers of the spine, they are length detectors of the spine. And they are innervated by dorsal rami of spinal nerves. So another way to organize all of these muscles that you need to learn is into their basic functions. Intrinsic muscles have roles for stabilization. So the semispinalis, the multifidus, transversospinals, interspinals, these are all shown here in this posterior view located right along the central core of the vertebral column. We also have intrinsic muscles that are going to provide a role in movement. Okay, so these are shown here with erector spinae. And again, erector spinae is located between posterior and middle layers of thoracolumbar fascia. Just a brief bit of information about spinal vasculature. This is a superior view of a thoracic or lumbar vertebra. And the primary blood supply of the vertebral column comes from thoracic or abdominal aorta. So the thoracic or abdominal aorta, they're both positioned right along vertebral bodies. And we say that the um, rest of the vertebra gets blood supply from segmental arteries of the trunk because the trunk includes the thorax and the abdomen. And depending on whether you're in the thorax or abdomen, you'll be, ge uh, be getting blood from one of the following segmental arteries. So in the thoracic region, this would be a posterior intercostal coming off of the thoracic aorta. When you're in the abdomen, this could be a subcostal artery or a lumbar artery. And from there, these segmental arteries will branch and anastomose to provide blood to the vertebral body, the vertebral canal, and the um, various other aspects of the vertebra. 
But the main point here is that it depends on what region of the vertebral column you are positioned in, on what type of segmental artery is providing blood to that vertebra. These will be branches off of either thoracic or abdominal aorta. Venous drainage will be a valveless system, meaning that the blood will just go in whatever direction is most optimal based on various gradients and other obstructions. So the blood doesn't really have a stereotypical pattern that it follows, but the ultimate goal is to drain into the azygous system. So the azygous system will be reviewed for you, and these azygous veins are positioned on either side of the vertebral column, and you'll find the following structures draining into these azygous veins. There's an anterior external vertebral venous plexus, as well as internal vertebral venous plexus, which has posterior and anterior components. Intervertebral arteries will then connect the internal vertebral venous plexus to the azygous system. And there'll also be a large vein within the body of the vertebra, and this is the basivertebral vein. Here are some muscles located on the anterior aspect of the vertebral column. The, ver uh, excuse me, the diaphragm has attachment onto the anterior aspect of the vertebral column, and this is by way of structures known as the crure, right cruce and left cruce. This is the right cruce here, this is the left cruce here. And they are tendinous extensions of the diaphragm that will anchor the diaphragm to the anterior vertebral column. There are other muscles attached to the anterior aspect of the spinal column, one being psoas major. See its anterior attachment, excuse me, its superior attachment onto the um, vertebral column, quadratus lumborum as well, and transversus abdominis. These horizontally oriented muscle fascicles here. This is the innermost layer of the abdominal muscles and it has attachment onto the vertebral column. And now here with our cross section through the thoracic spine, we can see where the vertebral canal is situated. Here's the thoracic aorta here. Here's the body, the thoracic body. Anterior root meeting up with ventral root to form the spinal nerve. Out here, this is the dorsal root ganglion. And then the spinal nerve will branch into an anterior and a posterior ramus. Keeping in mind that the posterior or dorsal ramus is going to divide into medial and lateral branches. So I hope that this lecture has been instructive in leading you through the following learning objectives that have been provided for you. If you need to follow up and ask any questions, you're definitely able to contact me, although it might be advisable to contact either Dr. Carey or Dr. Bookstein, um, as I may be on leave and unable to address your questions. Thanks for your attention, and I look forward to taking you through the extremities soon.